sometimes in the gallery, so we'll allow people to come in as as they do. But thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for the Harwood 100 More Visioning the Future Community Day. I'm Juniper Laracy, the director of the Harwood Museum of Art, and I welcome you to the Harwood and to be part of this collaborative community conversation. And how many uh, were able to attend on Friday? <laughs> and, um, and did anyone participate in Jacqueline's uh, workshops yesterday? Excellent. So uh, thank you. We, we tried to provide a wide variety of opportunities for people to engage in this conversation. But before I get started, I want to acknowledge the land that we stand on and respect, respectfully recognize the unique and enduring relationship that exists between the indigenous peoples and their traditional territories. We acknowledge that we are on the historic homeland of the Taos Tiwa Red Willow people within the original unceded lands of Taos Pueblo. This acknowledgement obliges us as a reminder for the ongoing efforts to be respect to respectfully recognize, honor, reconcile, and partner with the Red Willow people whose land and water and we benefit from today. We have an exciting series of events here this afternoon. So please stay for one or all, and regardless, thank you for joining us. The Harwood Centennial has been an opportunity for us to reflect on our past. We also believe that we need to look forward into the future and have the responsibility to create a more equitable and inclusive uh, future. The Harwood seeks to end the perpetuation of the past inequities by understanding the biases implicit in our own, the Harwoods, um, and Taos's art story. We are committed to working to rectify these inequities and desire to transform our future with a shared vision of creativity and a shared story of our art. While it is one thing for the Harwood to tackle this challenge internally, I truly believe that we can have a larger impact if we work together as a community, and that all of us who are responsible for telling the Taos narrative do so with awareness of an inclusive future. I'm also pleased to present a series of events designed to catalyze a vibrant, equitable, and inclusive creative Taos. First, we have our keynote presentation by Jacqueline Russell and Indigenous Visions for the Future of Museums. And then after that, there'll be a short break and at 1.30, we'll follow with a panel with uh, several museum leaders, including myself, uh, moderated by Jacqueline. And then we'll follow with um, Eduardo Martinez, who from Meridian, Meridian Strategies, who's working on our strategic plan, and he'll be doing a town hall's um, input session. Of course, I want to thank those who made this possible. I want to acknowledge Gwendolyn Fernandez and Hannah Cookville, the public programs team for doing so much to make this weekend happen, as well as our marketing, our facilities, our front of house, really it's a, it's a full, full effort, and our volunteers who helped us today. I want to thank our lead supporters for the Harvard Centennial, including the Henry Luce Foundation, Marianne Evans, Joyce and Sherman Scott, 203 Fine Art, Royal Seco Live, and the University of New Mexico Office of Academic Affairs and others. For Futures Weekend specifically, I want to thank New Mexico Arts, a division of the Department of Cultural Affairs, National Endowment of the Arts, and the Institute of Museum and Library Services, the Museums and Power Grant, which we received that has supported our diversity equity work. And I specifically want to thank the Lore Foundation and Sonia Strzok for supporting this weekend and making it possible to bring these activities and these events to you for free. I'm grateful for Sonia for being, as community officer, we're always looking for how to have a bigger impact in our community. As she, she's had the role in corporations and finance and moved into this community-focused position, and I think she's just an amazing addition to, to in this role for our community. So we're luck, lucky to have you advocate for us um, as we move forward into a vibrant house. So, do you want to say a couple words? <laughs> Thank you, Juniper. Um, you know, arts and culture have always been such an important part of our community and who we are. And whether 
You were born and raised here as a creative, or you moved here to find inspiration. Tufts has become home to many. Um, how we've infused those ideas and creativity along the way, how we've worked together to keep arts and culture alive and thriving, those are all parts um, of how we've come together as a community and something that I've been um, wholeheartedly passionate and interested in helping to keep that alive. Um, as we reflect on the past or we envision a future of arts and culture, I know that it'll always be part of that heart and soul of who we are, whether it's reflected in the paintings or the sculptures or the way that we engage. Um, it's such a beautiful story that we get to tell, so I'm thankful to have been able to sponsor and be part of that as a funder. Um, the Lore Foundation is a private family foundation, and we fund ideas and projects that improve quality of life. Um, this workshop, this series of workshops, all the work uh, that went into this weekend of events, this is exactly um, the kind of things that we hope to see and, and help uh, contribute to, to, to community and serve community in that way. So thanks for being here. Thank you, Jennifer, for your kind words. Um, and keep me in mind for future projects. Thank you so much, Sonia. I'm doing sort of double duty here and trying to get Jacqueline's presentation back up and working. And also um, introduce Jacqueline. So first, hi, I'm Gwendolyn Fernandez. I'm the Curator of Education and Public Programs here at the Harwood Museum. Um, and I just want to echo Juniper's words of thanks for the team that has put this weekend events on. Um, when you're done here in the auditorium, I'll just add, we do have a design challenge going on in our education studio. It is for all ages. Uh, we're using recycled cardboard to build prototypes for the future. So head on over to our education studio after this. So it's my job and pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker today. I met Jacqueline back in 2019 at a museum education conference uh, where she gave a talk somewhat similar to what she's going to be doing today, um, and was just really inspired by her presence, by her words, by her visions for the future uh, for, our, for our field, and have had the extraordinary pleasure of working with her at a couple of different museums that I've worked at. So it was really um, exciting when we were dreaming up this three days of future visioning, thinking who do we want to be part of this? Um, Jacqueline Stain Rose, um, to the top. So let me tell you um, just a little bit about her. Uh, Jacqueline is a citizen of the Navajo Nation and a proud Diné, I'm gonna say this wrong, this word wrong, Jacqueline. Adsa, uh, which is a Navajo woman who carries interwoven German and Scottish lineage. She is a New Mexico based nationally recognized facilitator, coach, and cultural equity consultant who believes in the power of indigenous ways of knowing and teachings to support the building of healthy, strong, and just communities. Jacqueline is a member of the Coaching for Healing, Justice, and Liberation School, where they learn and orient toward growth with some of the most radically heart-powered people on the planet. Russell comes to this work from a history of cultural production, curatorship, museum education, and offers coach partners a deep understanding of the oppressive nature of nonprofit institutions. They are one of eight co-founders of Native Women Lead. Jacqueline previously held the role of Decolonized Futures and Radical Dreams at the, it's a great title, <laughs> at the U.S. Department of Arts and Culture, where they co-steward the Honor Native Land Project. Russell was appointed to serve on the New Mexico Governor's Council for Radical Justice, and is an organizing member of the Indigenous Milk Medicine Collective. Russell has recently been appointed to be the director of the ASU LACMA Fellowship Program Administration at Arizona State University. Jacqueline lives, plays, farms, and makes home in the Pueblo of Tamaya with their husband and children. So please welcome Jacqueline. everyone. Thank you so much, Gwen, for the introduction. I am delighted to be here uh, with you all. 
I um, am wanting to, I'm going to back up to my first slide, Let's see. Um, just pay my own gratitude for the opportunity to be here in Tiwa Homelands. Um, I traveled up from our home in Tamaya, um, which is also known as the Pueblo of Santa Ana. I say at the bottom of the hills, <laughs> the bottom of the mountains. Um, and this is my first time visiting Taos, uh, and it is really beautiful and lovely. And we got to spend our morning yesterday uh, at the Pueblo of Taos with uh, community members and relatives as the Coalition to Stop Violence Against Native Women was um, holding their they, uh, We Will Run For Them uh, 5K race. Um, and I say it's a race, but it's really a community run and gathering. And it was really, uh, it's a cause that we support uh, and an organization that we support um, since I moved here to New Mexico in 2017. And so it feels really just, um, it felt really beautiful to get to be here to understand a little bit more um, about kind of Northern Pueblo, um, homelands from this place and to so just have immense respect for the community um, of a nation like of Taos Pueblo and just want to give that as part of my own acknowledgement. Um, I recognize that though I am an indigenous person, I live and make home in lands that are not mine. Um, I am traditionally accepted into the Pueblo of Santa Ana and that comes with a great deal of responsibility. A responsibility of being a mother of two children who are both Pueblo and Diné. And also a responsibility to understand what place names are, what songs come from there, and the ways in which uh, the community thinks of place and space um, and holds relationship to the river um, is all something that's really important to me and something that I do in addition to the work I do as a consultant and a writer. And <clears throat> so this is Indigenous Visions um, for the Future of Museums. And I was thinking about, well, how can I contextualize? I'm going all different ways. Close your eyes. Be surprised when I get to be excited. Okay. All right. And one of the things I thought I wanted to share with you all was one of my favorite memories of working in museums. And it happened in uh, the spring of 2018. I have had the, the blessing to be in and work with uh, and in partnership with so many different museums. Um, one of the times that I got to kind of hold another kind of radically new and different um, positions was at the uh, Museum of Us in San Diego. Uh, it used to be called the San Diego Museum of Man. Um, and I came in as their um, kind of inaugural uh, director of decolonizing initiatives and so much of my learning was really around what is the relationship look like between the museum and the homeland community um, that is there the Kumeyaay nation and <clears throat> the museum of us uh, still occupies and exists on the unceded land of the Kumeyaay people and in kind of learning about what it looks like, like my role and my responsibility in that position was really to think about, well, what does it look like to not just talk about decolonization of museums from a public programs place or a curatorial space, which often tends to be the focus, but what does it look like if these practices of decolonization are actually woven together? So we're thinking about it in terms of how, what does decolonizing initiatives look like from a facilities management perspective or a development kind of advancement place from the lens of like philanthropy. And it was such an exciting position because it was so much about 
but really thinking um, from a strategic thought partner perspective, like what do these initiatives mean? But also like how do we translate those into the work that, that do make museums exist? <clears throat> but one of my favorite days, and I, I can take no credit for the way in which it was planned, was they were planning to hold a community day in partnership with the Kumeyaay Nation. So when I got into the role in the early days of 2018, they were already messaging that Kumeyaay um, Community Day was going to be taking place on a particular day, I don't remember what month it was, um, but that if the museum was going to be closed to visitors for that time. And if you've ever been to Balboa Park, it, it is a massive um, tourist kind of vortex, <laughs> if you will, but also from the place of just people go to San Diego to visit the San Diego Museum of Man. It is a world-renowned institution. Um, and one of the things that I was coming into is recognizing that, yes, it is a world-renowned institution that also was really trying to reconcile and, and also contextualize the, the way that that recognition comes has been from a very co-opted, coercive, um, colonial legacy of co-opting other individuals and cultures from all over the world. And so it's really trying to sit with that world and that reputation and what it means to kind of deal with that and grapple with that. So Kumeyaay Day, we were talking about preparing the staff across the board. We needed everybody's help because we were moving hundreds of items from the cultural resources department. It literally took the team over a day and a half to move the hundreds of objects from the cultural resources department to the different areas in the museum all while being open um, and if you again if you've been to Belleville Park you're crossing like roads that there's a lot of coordination um, and so we get there early there as part of Kumeyaay Day there is a community feed that is planned so some team members were specifically just helping to feed people and that was all food that was not for us, uh, we had our own kind of sandwiches and things like that and pizza that we had, but everything from this particular food was traditional foods that were made. There was a Kumeyaay team member, Emily, who was really, really pushing through like the visioning of like, what does it look like as a museum to care for Kumeyaay com uh, community members um, on this particular day? And we message to folks that we don't want you to be on your phones. We don't want you taking any pictures of the cultural belongings that were coming out. Um, we don't want any sort of kind of othering, that idea of like us as museum professionals, whether indigenous or not, whether people of color kind of, you know, taking pictures of things that were happening and really kind of coming from this place of we were there for community. Like we were literally opening our doors to be in place. There were rooms for um, sacred um, cultural belongings. There were rooms for um, that had particular messaging of like who could and could not come in. My laptop is tired. <laughs> Keeps wanting to go to sleep. And as people are coming in, we had hundreds of people visiting that day. Um, my favorite memory was this thing, this image that only exists in my mind of Kumeyaay members coming up to sing bird songs to and for, not themselves, but to these hundreds of cultural belongings that are still in the care and stewardship of the Museum of Us. And while there has been much repair done in that relationship between this Kumeyaay Nation and the Museum of Us, it was a day in which there was celebration for getting to sing these songs to these belongings that needed to feed on those songs, that needed to hear those songs. And also that underlying grief that they weren't able to go home with them. That underlying grief that all of these belongings came to this museum through ways in which they did not consent to. That there were individuals who for many different reasons, in many different ways, there were pathways for these belongings into this museum that is world-renowned and recognized, but that was very much from this place of 
we are saving these indigenous people's belongings. They might not exist anymore, but we will have their baskets. We will have these pieces of pottery. We will have these belongings. And yet what a reclamation it was on this particular day, a small step toward healing in 2018 of what it meant to really reunite and begin to think about, well, what does it look like to forego the profit on a Saturday in Balboa Park, which is easily thousands of dollars in admissions for that day, to just say, we are closing for this day for these community members to have time with their belongings. There are ways in which we left open even just the um, gloves for people to hold things if they wanted to, but that it was also something we coached staff to not should people and be in this kind of place of like, don't touch that, don't touch that, don't do that. That it was very much like we worked with community members to show and share when there was a particular culture belonging that might be very, very fragile. Um, and how can they kind of communicate that? Like we do want to be respectful to the belonging and also to people. And so this day really changed my thoughts in terms of providing an example um, that I could take no credit for. I did not come up with this idea, but it was so beautiful to me and just being there and to hear these songs, songs not that come from my own people as a Diné person, but songs that were born there in Kumeyaay lands, like in what is today called like San Diego. And it was such a lasting impression on me of what could be possible if we move through, through this kind of new way of thinking about what museums could be. And I really come to this place um, and to this particular space here in Taos, on Tiwa lands, really thinking that the future of museums deeply depends on our ability to reimagine museums. That is really up to us for museums' relevance to continually be in existence. That if we want museums to exist, they have to be co-created with, with the community. And in particular with indigenous people, especially when we're stewarding collections that are not, um, have come to our, uh, our ownership or stewardship by means of what we call colonial pathways. So part of this healing and this reclamation it really needs us to like understand that as institutions themselves, as our own sector, there's an inherent asymmetry in museums. There's a long legacy of dehumanization and othering and really this kind of um, paternalistic view of saving culture in institutions. And in some instances, I see um, institutions today using language and taglines and catchphrases that are advancing you know, native culture and art. And it's like, oh, actually, it's the people who advance it. It's the artists who are the revolutionary thinkers that allow us to really think about what museum spaces can be. And museums, to me, are because of the many different policies, the ways in which they are constructed, sometimes not always able to be as nimble and as swift in their direction and action. And so that is also something we have to acknowledge. I also want to name that across the board, we're seeing, and I can attest to this, this lack of representation among museum leadership, of decision makers who are people of color, who are indigenous, who are um, representative of the culture, the people, the art in which we are trying to encourage to come in, that if we want um, more people of color, we have to have people of color who are helping us make decisions, shape programs, to be able to contextualize and create a sense of not just relevance um, on, com and communicating that to people, but also a sense of urgency, that we do need people from other cultures and other perspectives, other religions, other genders, other ages to really begin to build this museum of the future. And it is one that can be co-created. And lastly, I think it's also helpful to us, for us to recognize that in museums, there are no neutral decisions. There are ways in which we make decisions that sometimes, or we don't make decisions that communicate where we are not willing to step 
And sometimes what we're willing to step in what we're willing to defend, right? And the values by which we are communicating with our decisions, the particular direction, the priorities of a particular time. I think it's also really important to recognize that as an institution and as institutions across the country, museums are the most trusted. There was a survey that was done several years ago now, or nearly a decade ago now, that really identified the two most trusted entities in all of the United States are grandparents and museums. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I think that that is beautiful and exciting because it shows the potential, but it also tasks us with a great responsibility that if we don't recognize the systems that are existing when we talk specifically about museums that deal with communities of color and histories of community, communities of color and people, that we have to also visualize the lack of education that exists in our society as a whole. We have only two states in the United States that have comprehensive K-12 American Indian education, meaning that at every grade in those two states you learn about Native history and culture. Only two. Everywhere else in the United States, we you learn by mandate. You learn at the fourth grade level at social studies time, and then usually in high school during civics. Everything else depends on your teacher's awareness. It is also important to recognize that we're talking about this invisibility and erasure of different narratives of communities of color and um, histories of indigenous people this also depends so much on other industries like textbooks and who is writing textbooks and where these textbooks get tested. And oftentimes they get tested in the state of Texas and the state of California because there are high populations of people and because you can make money and show that like, oh, our textbook is successful because we have hundreds of thousands of books in X number of classes, right? But in the state of Texas, their standardized test actually has a true or false question that asks, and for students to get it right, they have to say true, that in the state of Texas, Native American people are extinct. So using the language associated with dinosaurs, right? Like we contextualize dinosaurs as like, dinosaurs are extinct, their woolly mammoths are extinct. Well, in the state of Texas, to get that question correct, you have to say true. And I had a friend who was reading to children, and the child was so just, he, he said, I could see this child just looking at me like, I had a third eye and could not, like, understand, like, why this child, like, what was going on? And so I asked questions, and then I could see her hand slowly raise up, and she says, sir, you said that you are Native American, but we've learned that Native Americans are extinct. So I don't know that you're actually a Native American, because I was told that they didn't exist anymore. Wow. And he, he just looked at her and was like, wow, like that is that is part of this system. And so we're thinking about this idea of <clears throat> that this particular, this lack of education is connected to. It's very much in alignment with the structure of settler colonialism, which is this particular project of the, that hinges on the dispossession of Native people to our lands. The ways in which that the United States could not exist were it not for the stolen land and the stolen slave labor that would that made it possible. And by the continual dis disposition, meaning that we as institutions, as people, if we're living on land and we're not paying taxes to the indigenous stewards of, of the place through which our home is on, our place of business is on, our museum is on, we are indeed benefiting from the settler colonial project. And that there are many ways in which the settler colonial project it continues and it is this intersecting um, challenge that we are all faced because by the ability of not having accurate portrayals in education or on Google image search or in museums, it actually is really easy for us to get to particular statistics where the Reclaiming Native Truth study surveyed people, and I forget the year, but this was in the last 10 years, and found that 40% of Americans believe that indigenous people no longer exist. 
And this particular study kind of breaks this down that people believe that they've never met a Native American person. And in actuality, when you think about Native people being one to two percent of the entire population, it's not that they haven't met a Native American person. It's that the people that they meet who are indigenous do not match what exists in their mind of who a Native person is. Because when we're thinking about and I didn't include it in this particular project, or in this particular presentation, but I have a particular project that's inspired by the uh, indigenous photographer, Matika Wilbur, and she does this, this um, activity in her talks where she shares these screenshots of Google image searches from different communities of color. So she can look at and shares Asian American to Black American, African American communities to Latinx community members. And then there's an interesting that happens in each of these communities of color, there are definitely offensive images that, that surface in a Google image search. But there's an interesting thing that additionally happens, there's a leap in time that occurs when you're looking at Native American images, that they become almost all exclusively historical images. The images that are shown are almost all from Plains community members. They are wearing buckskin, they were wearing headdresses. So it is this monolith of an image that we hold in our country of who Native American people are. And it is changing, but it is something that we have to be conscious of that majority of the people who do not come to museums, which is actually a very large majority, right? We have a lot of people who don't come to museums, who don't feel welcomed, um, that from that group of people, they're also holding their own mistruths. And so if we're able to get curious about what that looks like, and if we're including or trying to um, want to be inclusive of Native people or other communities of color, we have to think about, well, what, what information exists and how can we find the antidote? What is the counterweight to this? And so my offering is that the counterweight in many cases is both um, a combination of decolonized practices, but also indigenous leadership and praxis. And by, by I come from um, a mom, I'm the daughter of an educator, and the daughter, my dad is a photojournalist by training, so very much an artist. And both of them, I like tease me about the ways in which I talk about my work. I very much grew up with my culture intact. I'm a res girl. I um, grew up in Kayenta, which is right near Monument Valley. Um, and I was actually looking at a book in the Harwood, um, and there was this image. Um, it was a book that I believe was from that was produced by Site Santa Fe, but it's indigenous contemporary art. And there's an image of Halea Sinigini, who's a uh, well-known Navajo photographer, um, that has a uh, picture of Monument Valley, so like the mittens, and in the text on the, um, the in the sky, it says like, my culture is not a car commercial, or my this is not a car commercial, it is my culture. Mm -hmm. And I grew up right near with Monument Valley as my back door. So like the image of like Forrest Gump running through like Monument Valley. Um, um, I'm trying to think of the Matthew McConaughey, Matthew McConaughey, you know, driving like the sports cars in there. Like all of that is very much my context of what it means to be a native person uh, living in a tourist town with like this beautiful backdrop and like playground to like wealthy corporations and 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 people. Um, and so I talk and I learn this language of like what it means to decolonize and my parents tease me about this decolonized language and I, and I think that it can be very political and I think off-putting for many people, um, but at its core what my demand is, what fellow colleagues demand is, is that a decolonized practice is about thinking about who has the power when we're reading the stories that we're reading. Who is, as we are taking in an exhibit, as we're reading a book, um, who is holding the power in this story? If it is a power, if it is a story about Native people and the storyteller is someone who's non-Native, well, how close to the culture, the community are they able to get? How can we become critical readers, critical reviewers, critical museum goers by really thinking about, well, who's telling this story and should it be coming from this people, from this particular person? 
I get, <clears throat> my inbox gets flooded by people who will write me and say, I know you're a writer, I have a really great idea, I really want to support indigenous voices. I have this particular manuscript and I would love for you to sign off on it so I can support your work. And it's like, <laughs> but this is your story about my people and my culture and that's not inclusion to me. And so I think that this particular antidote and this offering and this, this idea, a way of thinking through decolonization is about shifting power and like who's telling the story? How can we get creative in it? So Decolonize This Place like, is actually a, a mobilized community effort in, uh, the, um, in New York City. And I'm actually taking this, I don't, I'm not referencing them, but I'm referencing this idea of, and praxis and theory of um, decolonization, which really relies on three things within museums. And it can relate across the board to many different things. But one, it demands truth telling. That effective decolonization process allows us and demands that we tell truth even when it might be that we're admitting our own fallacy, our own mistakes, that decolonization or this ability to tell the truth that yes, we want to engage with your community and we recognize that we made mistakes. Whether that's like big mistakes and just like we've not engaged with you for 40 years of our organization's institution, like that is harm in and of itself. But sometimes it's also truth telling and like, I've come in and I consult with different institutions who will bring me in and be like, we don't, we just realized that we hired a new person and they uncovered that the person who was in their position before was not inviting tribal members, was not communicating to them, was not engaging with them at all, and was actively not, and like on purpose, not following particular protocols that are mandated by law, right? And so this is part of the truth, and we have wonderful legislation that is not comprehensive, it's not a solve-all, like NAGPRA, the American Religious Freedom Act, that do require institutions to be compliant. But it's also, we're entering a time where it's also important for us to be critical of what it means to be NAGPRA compliant. That being NAGPRA compliant doesn't mean you have a healthy relationship with indigenous communities at your institution. And I think sometimes we need that truth to match the reality so that we can actually build forward. Collaboration and decolonization can look like partnering with or with um, indigenous knowledge holders in ways that are compensated. Um, and then the engagement of indigenous perspectives so that we are sharing these leadership and decision-making opportunities. And so this framework that I use is actually, I want to credit Dr. Amy Lone Tree, um, a Ho-Chunk scholar, who really contextualized a lot of what it means to decolonize in museums. I also want to offer as an example, a fictional character from um, Rutherford Falls. My bestie is, was co-creator of this show and it aired on NBC Peacock. Um, and <clears throat> uh, meet, uh, meet Regan Wells. Regan Wells is a member of the fictional Minishanka um, community, nation. And one of the <clears throat> examples from the show that I just completely fell in love with, one, um, there are not a lot of museum people that we get to geek out like in pop culture. And so Sierra, who's one of the co-creators of the show, and I actually met at a museum. Um, <laughs> and seeing this particular depiction of um, Regan is at this, she works at this very, very small tribal cultural center and she wants to build a museum. And it's a cultural center that's really a room inside of a casino and she was trying to gain support within her community. And so her kind of antagonist be, then become mentor shares that, well, nobody likes you. <laughs> Nobody likes you, and you have to really think about, like, I'm going to tell you the truth, but I also want you to really begin to think about what ways can you begin to build relationship with your community members. And so he takes her around um, town this one day, and he introduces her and kind of uses, like, his, uh, he's uh, the, one of the tribal chairmen. And introduces Regan and says, you know, so is there anything you need? 
And at one point, one of the aunties says, actually, I need some wood for winter. It's been getting really cold. And he's like, okay, we can go chop some wood. And so he sends her out, and she's like, oh, man. And he says, you want people to like you. You also are trying to get people to trust you. Go out and chop some wood. And like, don't be so arrogant and lose your humility that you can't do hard work. And that idea, I feel like, is very much the epitome of what Indigenous leadership can look like. That sometimes we think that the relationship building only happens within museum walls. And then actually, in actuality, culture of Indigenous communities is continuing. We exist today. We are here today. And sometimes our support of initiatives looks like you coming and like offering to chop wood when we need wood chopped, right? It's not pretty, it's not glamorous, and it's definitely hard. But that idea of like indigenized museum professional, thinking of like what ways can we get our hands dirty? Sometimes we want to think about the radical vision for a museum's future, and we are already at the place of like wanting to harvest the corn, right? We want to be at the table eating together at that big long community table, and we forget that the hard work actually comes not just by planting the seed, but showing up every day to irrigate, to water, to be in the place of weeding that all of those things get us to that community table. And that I think is, that is what indigenized practices are. It's a practice that allows us to be in community, learning together, doing hard work that definitely is not glamorous. So these tools, building with mutuality, but that both whether you choose or think about and contextualize this work within the realm of a decolonized path, or indigenized practice, that the tools are very much similar, that we're building with mutuality, that means that we are not just looking for some um, benefit on our end, that the mutuality is one that's full of reciprocity. The creative destruction piece is that sometimes we do things over and over and over again as museums uh, that aren't working, right? So creative destruction means that we're actually taking things apart. We're being critical in our understanding and saying, well, that program's not working, or the way that we're doing this is not working, that we can actually rethink and reimagine the process. And then lastly, a willingness to surrender, surrender power, surrender the power, whether that's the institution, um, museum exhibit walls, that we're really thinking about this perspective of um, giving museum galleries space over, and that was a, a, a a gift that I got to experience uh, in a previous institution I was working at. And it was really around this like co-created curation um, that was basically, I'm like, I just need a box. Just give me the exhibit and we'll figure it out from there. And the perspective of being able to have murals brought together, um, co-created sculptural pieces. Uh, there was a co-created uh, video game called Alien Sheep from outer space that was made during this. And so it was like the, the beauty of the different types of art forms was all something really exciting and really new. And it definitely made the curatorial team nervous. It made uh, museum leadership nervous because they didn't know what they were gonna get. <clears throat> One of my favorite quotes like across the board is from uh, black queer feminist Adrienne Marie Brown who shares um, as part of this emergent strategy moving at the speed of trust that when we're building relationships where we're thinking about healing and, and repair, that moving at the speed of trust can really help us to accelerate the work that we're doing. It can be a catalyst. Um, and I will add that we can only move as fast as our trusting partner. And that particular um, dynamic of when, they, when a committee is moving along and we have somebody who's really be needing to be more intentional, needing to slow things down, that that can be a learning moment. And oftentimes the ways in which we tend to push back at some points um, and be like, oh, well, we have to, like the sense of urgency can really um, provide cracks in relationship building. 
we're living in a time where I feel like there's such a fluorescence like of Native representation, a shift and change. Well, we're still facing the same problems of violence against our people, um, the rates of invisibility and erasure. We're also entering a moment where there is more um, working toward us from pieces of legislation to um, even just pop cultural references, like having new um, definitions and visuals of what and who Native people are. Um, different collectives like here in New Mexico who are working um, from a grassroots level, community organizing level, and really trying to build their um, collective like energy around creative endeavors that don't just aren't necessarily something that happens in museum spaces or in gallery spaces, but that are happening in healing gardens, that are happening in uh, quilting and like sewing circles, that all of these things are creative acts. And that this ability to be in this moment of time is one that I feel, and I have to believe as a mom of two, um, provides us with a unique sense of opportunity um, that I, I really hope that we're able to catalyze and work um, in partnership with established institutions like the Harwood. Um, and that we can really envision what it looks like and means to build a museum that isn't um, held back or, or stuck whether that's in location or whether that's in frame of thinking. <clears throat> and so, you know, last thing I say is that I think one of the things that I use as a model and a practice in my own work is really trying to think about every opportunity that I have, whether I'm in a consultant position, whether I'm in a guest speaker position, but that every opportunity I have and interaction I get to experience with community is one in which there can be healing happening. Um, and that particular frame of reference and understanding comes from my own background in um, healing justice and museum education, um, definitely my experience like as a coach, but that idea of thinking about how we repair the harm of the past, like there is, there is so, so much. Um, the closing state, the closing statement, the um, piece, there's a piece of legislation that we got to pass at the Museum of Us um, right before I left um, to actually have my first child. Uh, and it was called the Colonial Pathways Policy. And the Colonial Pathways Policy was voted and passed onto the board and it's trying to be uh, operationalized in different phases now at the Museum of Us, but it's a piece of policy that identified. <clears throat> so there's an existing um, policy that we had on the books prior to my starting that was about no longer um, exhibiting any ancestral remains or anything, of course, that was NAGPRA, uh, that would be flagged from NAGPRA, that's the Native American Graves and Repatriation um, Act, but that if the colonial pathways policy, the differential was that the policy opened up um, the examination of over 80% of the museum's collection to being um, open for return back to cultural communities uh, in Turtle Island and all over the world. Um, and so it was a brave like act to be able to sign and put on paper in that it meant that of this hundreds of thousands um, of cultural belongings in the care of the Museum of Us, that 80% of those belongings could potentially be returned back to community, but also that in the cases where community was not able to receive those particular pieces or didn't want to for whatever reason, that it would actually enter into content, uh, continuing consent, meaning that on an ongoing basis, that they would have touch points at the museum for, okay, we still have these pieces. Do you, is this something that we are still in stewardship of, or do you want them back? Understanding that maybe today the art form of basketry is alive and well, but who's to say because of climate change and climate crisis five, 10 years from now, there would be a change in biodiversity that would be, would be um, shifting like that particular art form that at any point, any future generation could have 
access to these belongings um, when they wanted them and when they needed them, which is very different from the ways in which the uh, relationships of stewardship and curation and collection and care um, looks today. And so there are these different models of what like healing can look like and what repair can look like um, that are existent in definitely like in museums that I have worked with, but there are so many other museum professionals that are doing this work. And that is also part of the museum fluorescence that's happening today, is people getting their degrees, getting apprenticeships, who are working in museums, who are working in cultural institutions and tribal organizations that are really thinking about these practices and policies in a way that can be more generative and healing for their community today and for um, the younger generations moving forward. So thank you all so much. We have room to take a couple of questions if we have any from the audience. Yes. Jacqueline, thank you for the great talk. Um, I love hearing about your work with the Museum of Us. Would you be willing to share, because you've talked about all the amazing things that happened, some of the difficulties you faced that you can share, and how you surmounted those? Um, so I think that one of the things, I think across the board when I look at the different institutions that I've worked at, whether it's the Museum of Us or the Heard Museum, these are very nationally, in many cases, internationally recognized um, museums. And I think that they're, I can speak from a, I feel more comfortable speaking from this like, personal experience. As an indigenous person, there's an impossibility that you feel in the work that you do and the work that you carry with me as a member of, um, of an indigenous community and seeing institutions um, participate in ways that maybe don't have alignment to your particular values, where there's um, just a sense of like, well, I don't understand. And the challenge that you feel when it's, uh, you're seen as the representative or you're seen by your community, the greater indigenous community is having a lot more power than you do. And I think that that particular feeling is one that, um, I don't think that I overcome. Uh, the reason why I'm a consultant is because it's actually really hard to be in space with the, with some of these like radical ideas as part of like my ethos and like personal beliefs. That it's actually easier for me today to be like pushing from the outside and being able to like be bold in uh, what you say because you're you don't have the fear of. Um, polarization or retribution, like being on staff. And um, I think that one of the things that I have seen as really uh, key in like shifting some of these dynamics is that there are greater numbers like of people. So just from like a representation perspective, in many of these institutions where it's not just hiring one or two Native people, but then if you have a cohort of Native people who are coming on to steward particular work, um, I think those are things that really help to create a sense of not necessarily community. I think that happens, can happen on its own, but I think a sense of like solidarity of shared experience that can be really beneficial in moving policies forward, but also beneficial in terms of um, making changes, whether that's collection perspective. There have been some great work that has been done like the Indian Arts Resource Center um, at SAR around just collaboration guidelines, both on behalf of museums and on behalf of um, well, on behalf of museums, but from the viewpoint of if your institution works with Native people or if you're uh, Indigenous people working with institutions, things to keep in mind, I think that some of those policies, I think, are really great. And I think that in the work that I do, education and like sharing about how these, the stuckness that might be felt like within an institution can actually be eased a bit when we're recognizing that museums are just one part of this like interweb of different types of structures 
but that's why it's hard to like move like faster and that's why things aren't always as responsive as we want them to be um, and I think that awareness of like having more education at the staff level but definitely at the board level so that policies and shifts are able to be made like those are the things I think that begin to make a difference in like shifting like who is holding the power um, and who is making decisions because oftentimes what I've seen as happening is that the staff can be really certain and hear from community members about the path forward from particular from from partners from indigenous communities from other communities of color but oftentimes for various reasons there's a lack of awareness that can exist at the board level that can really be um, a, a hurdle in trying to get like more progressive like legislation i think one of the things that made the work at the museum of us very successful was that i was coming in in a moment of time like and there were so many years prior to me being on there that this movement toward an integration of decolonized initiatives um were like breadcrumbs it was it was really being piecemeal um but the catalyzing moments were really, really working with the board in a way that they saw, like, we get why this is important. And so there were people who were able to hold coalition at the board level who were then able to support me and the rest of the staff, like, at, on the staff level at the institution. And then from that, it became, like, a kind of waterfall from the top toward people who were, like, then frontline you know, frontline being like museum um, admissions, kind of visitors focus folks. And so I think that those kind of initiatives and support um, can be really helpful, but I also think it's helpful, like just from a truth telling perspective, the ways in which like we're thinking about moving things forward, um, that if we're able to talk about it more, then it becomes um, <laughs> like less scary uh, and when we're able to acknowledge that we are one institution in this web of like other institutions who are dealing with it in sometimes like the similar ways or um, in more challenging ways that there are ways there's there's a community of practice that can be built and I think that that's really exciting too. So I feel like I gave an answer that was could have been two questions, but I'll do like one last question. Maybe it's a short one. I, I, I appreciate your comment about moving at the speed of trust and your least trusting partner. And I think that the question I have is sometimes the, the partners you need are the ones that trust you the least. And, and therefore, it's hard for them to engage or, or want to support your initiatives. And that's usually the place where the efforts are abandoned, right? And so I, I'm wondering if you have any suggestions for museum leaders and other committee members around how to work through those, those that dynamic. So I tend to be in the camp of keep inviting, keep telling, keep uh, engaging, even when you aren't seeing people come to the table, right? The consistency of being able to continually communicate that partners are welcome to particular meetings, that your voice is needed, that we are committed to this, but also from a place of reciprocity. Well, what's happening like within, if you're thinking about tribal communities or particular <coughs> tribal organizations, what ways, I feel like what's underestimated, what's not understood about Native nations is that Native nations, Native entities are continually asked over and over again for the limited resources that our communities have whether that's for sponsorship of galas, for, you know, for donations of artwork, right? And I think that sometimes what's forgotten is like the reciprocity. Well, how are you coming back and like giving into that particular thing? How are you showing up for community runs that are happening like in, in, uh, in your backyard? Um, that those things make a great deal of effort that showing up to chop wood well, I think getting curious about, well, what is the chopping wood? What ways can I chop wood for this particular organization? Um, and what ways can we support without, with consent, but also without having to, them to have the labor of like inviting and asking and trying to engage you to come to particular things. And I think that it's, it's thinking from that place of reciprocity. Yeah. 
I really appreciate that question and wholeheartedly agree that I think sometimes the work that we need to do is not with the, the partner that's ready with their hand up, always able to want to work with us, but like exactly who said, the people who don't trust us the most is where we need to kind of really lean some time into like tilling, tilling that soil. <clears throat> Thank you all so much. So we are going to take a brief pause while we reset. Um, Jacqueline's going to stay with us, and we're going to invite several of our museum leaders in our community here in Taos to engage in a conversation about the future of museums here in Taos. So we'll take about a max of five minutes to do that. Um, so if you need to stretch your legs, get, go to the bathroom, take a drink of water, but come back here in five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 